uh, hoping to achieve musically by when you perform Hugo Largo? Have fun. <laughs> Be in a band, play in clubs, try to do something a little different while maybe having the same effect on people that uh, a more traditionally structured rock and roll band would have. How, how do you see the, um, your position vis-a-vis -vis rock music? Do you consider it rock? Yes, but we're outsiders. I mean, even as rock is an outsider's form, we are outsiders to the form itself. We just happen to live in rock clubs. And hopefully maybe have the same effect on people that a sort of both that a good, hard rock and roll band would have and that a good sort of sensitive, evocative form of music would have, sort of have that simultaneously and bring that to sort of, you know, a, a stage more traditionally, more suited towards more like traditional beer-soaked rock and roll. Can you talk a little bit individually about your background? Starting with? Starting with, huh? Well, I guess I'm, I'm probably the only musician in the band. Uh, I started out um, with classical violin training and I gave that up for years um, playing mainly just you know a guitar. I was self-taught playing in the rock and roll bands of no great renown. Um, until I joined Hugo Largo I was working mainly as a recording engineer um, and not really performing music until I joined Hugo Largo. Um, I played with Glenn Branca a little bit. That's where I met Tim and Adam. And um, Hugo Largo sort of got me started playing music again, because um, until that time, I didn't really feel like I, there's much that was, you know, interest, interesting to me until that time. Maybe. I came to New York City to dance. I went to school for dance, and this was a place to come. I have always loved music, but never wanted to be in a rock and roll band. Um, Hugo Largo started out as an idea, a conceptual thing, and the venues were rock and roll clubs. It wasn't at all a rock and roll band at first. and. Uh, I still do some performance stuff on the sly. I still love performance art a lot. And uh, Hugo's developed into more of a band and a serious thing, and it's a lot of fun. Actually, I have a sort of a similar story to what Han was saying about sort of sliding back into music through Hugo Lago. I basically stopped playing music for all intents and purposes and as a bass player I was sort of somewhat frustrated with the limitations that were imposed by other band members you know guitarists and drummers primarily I guess um, on what they felt a bass player could be and Hugo Largo when I first saw it really seemed to offer a way of expressing myself which uh, I hadn't really found through other other uh, musical endeavors and got me a lot more excited to the exclusion of the other things which I do, which are primarily visual arts, photography. And uh, here I sit. I was working primarily as a uh, journalist, radio DJ, occasional club DJ. This is in the early 1980s, like 1981, 1982. And uh, a lifelong NYU student. And uh, I always thought maybe one day I'd be in a band. And a friend of mine was reforming a hardcore band called Even Worse that had sort of existed in sort of 1979 and 1980, and it had broken up, and he was putting it back together. A friend of mine named Jack Rabbit, and he said, uh, well, Tim, if you buy a bass, you can be in this band, even though I didn't really know how to play. So I bought a bass off the street for $80 from this guy standing outside a music store. His name was Tommy Jones. He was this really funny old black guy. And uh, I got to be in Jack's band, and Thurston Moore was also in that band, and that lasted for a little while. And then uh, I started thinking that there was life beyond imitating members of The Clash and Dee Dee Ramone. And uh, I thought it'd be interesting to try to play with some ideas, just having to do with two basses and not a whole lot else. And uh, I met Mimi through a mutual friend 
named Lucy Sexton. And uh, I knew Mimi's work as a performance artist, and I thought it was completely wild and completely charming and completely different and completely witty and completely scary. And I thought, even though she hadn't been in a band, I thought if she could apply, if it'd be fun to be in a band with that person, they would do things that a singer hadn't done before. And I'm extraordinarily happy with the way it's turned out. How, how do you see uh, Hugo Largo in relation to the other groups making music in New York, or do you think about that as an issue? We're, we're making music out of New York City, definitely. There's music that comes from four people who've lived in New York City for well over half a decade now, and have been working together for nearly half a decade. And uh, it's music that comes, that was formed in, you know, little apartments on the Lower East Side and lofts on 14th Street. And it doesn't sound like what most people traditionally think New York City music sounds like, which I suppose is like New York Dolls or Sonic Youth or the Ramones or television or Talking Heads, um, all of which represents some aspect of stuff that comes from the streets. And it sounds like the streets, but to me, stuff can come from the streets and come from really crowded apartments. And when you create music in those environments, there's a need to create something that doesn't shout about the streets. It shouts about the places that you want maybe to get away to. Um, I'd like to think there's probably not another New York band like us. And people are usually a little confused when they find out we are from New York City. But we're definitely from New York City, and we're definitely a product of the uh, the rock clubs in the city and going to the rock clubs in the city and the performance spaces in the city and the economic realities of the city.